Mobile hunters, are you looking to make the move to saddle hunting this year? Or maybe you just want to add a few new pieces of gear or upgrade your current saddle gear. If that's the case, then head over to tetherednation.com where they've got all mobile hunters covered. Whether you're new to saddle hunting or an old timer, Tethered is your one-stop saddle shop. From saddles to ropes, sticks, ascenders, whatever it is you need, they have you covered. I've personally been using their gear for the past three seasons. Now, my base setup consists of the Phantom Saddle and the Predator Platform. And if you're wondering why I've chosen to use their gear above all else, here's the cliff notes. They're innovative and pushing the mobile hunting forward overall. They cut no corners and prioritize the safety and performance of their gear. They care about the community that they've created, and their gear allows me to hunt free. And above all else, I like to support good people doing good work. If you're interested in upping your mobile hunting game, then head to tetherednation.com. This podcast is brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. Skull Brew Coffee roasts premium single-origin coffee guaranteed to deliver the freshest coffee directly to your doorstep. The kicker? They're 2% for conservation certified and donate 10% of their proceeds back to organizations who support the interests of our hunting community. So go to SkullBrewCoffee.com and pick up one of their three killer roasts and fuel your hunt and fill more tags with Skull Brew Coffee. Welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 211. Today we're talking about making the transition to hunting public land and hunting stories with my buddy Aaron Hepler. So stay tuned. All right, all right, all right. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you are doing well. Hope you are feeling fine. I am actually feeling pretty good. Today I was finally able to get back out in the timber. It seems like the shoulder is healing up a little bit to where I was able to pull the bow back this past week um, consistently enough and shot well enough that I felt that I was in good enough shape to head out to the timber and do and start putting on some late season hunts. So I got about a month left, roughly or to the end of January, to try to fill fill a few tags. And so we're gonna get after it the best that we can and <clears throat> see if we can make a little bit of magic happen and see where things land. If nothing else, we're gonna start learning some things for uh, for next year. But with that, I'm not gonna belabor the upfront here. I'm gonna just ca- kind of get straight to the 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 cut of my jib. But before I do that, there's two things you're gonna want to hear because I have two pieces of information that I think you guys will want to take advantage of. First, you guys know that I like to travel to hunt, and along with that comes hitting application deadlines, buying preference points, and it can get confusing because the deadlines all are different dates. I put them in my phone, then I'll hit ignore, and I forget about it, and I've missed plenty of deadlines because of that. So this year, I started using a tool called Hunt Reminder. If you go to huntreminder.com, you can check it out. Use the promo code TRUTH, and you get $5 off your first year. But I literally just got my first reminder that I just got the text message that the non-resident Iowa turkey, spring turkey uh, application period has just opened. So it sent me the reminder to tell me that I can now go ahead and sign up for my application for a spring turkey in Iowa. So what is Hunt Reminder? It's an application period and lottery reminder service. They essentially have a database of over 470 different application periods across both the U.S. and Canada. This ranges from big game, small game, migratory birds. The application periods include Preference points, public land drawings, youth hunts, so anything you would want to hunt, any type of hunt you would like to do, they likely have a reminder specifically for that. When users sign up, you can select which application periods you'd like to get reminders for, and you'll get a text message or an email notification whenever that application period opens. Like I said, I just got the one for the spring turkey in Iowa. You get another reminder when there's one week left, and then you get a final reminder when there's only 24 hours remaining. They also include uh, include direct links to online applications. Hunt Reminder only costs $19.99 for an annual subscription, which comes out to about $1.67 per month. And users can use the promo code TRUTH, like I'd mentioned, and get $5 off your first year, bringing it down to just $14.99. Join thousands of other hunters who rely on Hunt Reminder by going to HuntReminder.com and signing up today. Your next tag is waiting. Second, you guys know that when my boys over at Exodus are dropping some savings, I like to pass this information along to you guys. You know that I trust their cameras. I rely on their cameras especially you've been stoked and really using the, their Exodus render cell camera. And so with that, here valid only during the month of January, they are doing a pre-sale on their Exodus render, which is their 4G Verizon, 4G LTE camera that is now available for pre-sale. So the demand for this particular camera has been has been crazy, and they were out of stock during their annual Black Friday sale. So what they decided to do 
is that starting right now, they're extending some of those best prices that they had during Black Friday to the listeners of this podcast. So all of January, you can save $35 on each camera that you buy using the code RENDER35. This code will also work for any of their solar panel bundles and also their security bundles. If you want to be sure to be the first to know about these updates on pricing and, 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 and cool things that they have going on, you want to make sure you head over to XSOutdoorGear.com and sign up for their newsletter at the bottom of their website. If in case you're not familiar with Exodus, which I'd find it hard to believe if you listen to this show, all of their cameras are backed by a five-year no BS warranty and even includes a five-year theft and damage coverage. They simply have the best trail camera warranty in the industry and have the customer support to back everything up. The cameras just flat out work. So don't hesitate. Make sure to take advantage of those savings. Head over to ExodusOutdoorGear.com. Use the promo code RENDER35. So with that, I have a cool share for you today. I'm joined by my buddy, Aaron Hepler. Aaron is a fellow Pennsylvania public land hunter. Uh, We don't live too awful far from each other, so we hunt very similar type of habitat. Um, However, he is just a little further west, so it is just slightly different than what I have in in the area that I hunt. We talk a little bit about those differences and some of those similarities. We also had a very similar kind of transition into hunting public land overall, where we both kind of grew up heavily steeped in the Pennsylvania hunting heritage. And then over time, you know, transitioned from hunting our families, you know, back 40s or farms or whatever, and then transitioning more into um, hunting public lands. And then more specifically, we start talking about the, uh, about hunting big woods where, you know, he and I both have an affinity for finding larger tracks and, you know, and, and, and larger kind of pieces to, to, to roam, uh, to roam freely. Uh, this podcast is a part one of, uh, of a two part series just because Aaron and I spent uh, like two and a half hours together. So it felt most appropriate that we break this up into two sessions, but before we get jumped in, as always, I want to thank you all for listening. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I am today joined with a buddy of mine who he's, well, I'm going to refer to him as a brother because he's, he's also from Pennsylvania, man. And like, if we're, if you're a, a public land bow hunting whitetail freak from Pennsylvania, I feel like we're all kind of birds of a feather. And so I got love for all of them, unless you give me reason not to. And uh, I'm talking to another, another other than Mr. Aaron Hepler. What's going on, brother? How you doing? Nice to talk to you, buddy. Yeah, man. Appreciate you. Uh, appreciate you coming on, making some time to to come hang out in this uh, in these super strange and weird times. Very super strange and weird. They'll they'll be like that for a while. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? So we we finally. It seems like maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe I'm ho- I'm hoping so. We'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, you all, I you know we've talked about it. I'm I'm a healthcare worker in the intensive care, so. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's one of the big things right now, right? Everybody's re- waiting for the vaccine, but right, everyone, yeah, waiting for that magic bullet, all right? Yeah. It's you know, yeah, man, it's super, super strange and and and, and weird. It, it's I don't know if there's been like a um, and this is very, you know, I'll refer to it as secondary and not important at all, <laughs> but I almost feel like, you know, there. I guess I'll ask it this way. Your opinion, do you feel like you saw more hunting pressure this year because people had more time or, or is that just like, am I making that up? No, man, it is absolutely true that one of the, one of the big things I scout, I do when I scout is look for people sign and it is everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and not even just, not even just hunting pressure, just hikers and people deciding they're going to camp wherever, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. It's not even just, just hunting pressure. Yeah. But uh, uh, deer can't really tell a difference. So no, no, so, can't. Uh, you know, living in like Appalachian country, it, it's pretty hard cause it's a, they're popular areas to be for anybody that's recreating. So, right. Yeah. No, I had some of that in a couple of the pieces that I was hunting that was near water. There was a lot of like kayakers, boaters, fishers, you know, mm-hmm. or fishermen. And, you know, when you got into, you know, small game, it was duck and goose, you know what I mean? And so, it was just, it was almost nonstop. And the setup I had was actually close to water. So it's like, yeah. I could literally watch people kind of go by and, and stuff like that. Um, it'd be interesting to kind of go back and look at some of the trail cameras I had around there and to see like, if there was any different movement based on like the weather. So I thought like when the weather changed and it got cold, I was like, man, yeah, there might be some duck hunters out or whatever, but like the recreational kayakers and stuff like that. And like the whatever it is, the stand-up thing that they use, the stand-up kayak thing. I don't, paddleboard thing. Yeah, paddleboard thing. 
I was like, those folks aren't going to be out whenever it's like 34. You know what I mean? <laughs> kidding me? Like I'm sitting in my, I'm sitting in a tree and I hear like some people young. And I see like four people, probably were like college kids or whatever. I saw them. Like they had like a cooler, you know, probably drinking some beers, yeah. paddle boarding down through. And I'm like, man, it's like 42 degrees out and windy and you're out yeah. like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, uh, I definitely thought I felt like there was a little bit more pressure this year, especially the areas I was in. Hikers, definitely. There's a uh-huh. spot that I hunt that, that's like big, like a big hiking area. And yeah. I saw a lot of, like, they would actually ask me as I was walking out, they're like, Hey, is, it's a hunting season. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. yeah. And I'd be like, yeah, it's an archery only right now. So you're okay. Like just, I wouldn't go tromping through the woods necessarily, you know, as long as you're on the trail, you'll be all right. And then bear came in. I think it was the first weekend of like bear season or the first, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. Gun season for bear. And they were asking me and I came out with my orange and they didn't have any orange or anything on. And I'm like, they're like, is it hunting season? I was like, well, yeah. I was like, it's gun season right now for bear. I was like, man, I was like, you guys don't have a stitch of orange on. I was like, I wouldn't, he had like three small kids with him. I'm like, I was like, I don't, I didn't see any hunters when I was in there. Like the area I was in, I was like, I don't know where you guys are walking to. I was like, but I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't chance it. I'd probably go somewhere else if you don't have any orange. Yeah. We, um, I put on some drives during the rifle season for some friends that hadn't, hadn't shot anything yet. And we were actually near an area that's pretty popular for, uh, uh, mountain biking and they're dudes riding around in their black biking suits in the middle of rifle seat. I'm like, man, that is a bad, that, yeah, it's, it's coming right for me. You know, yeah, it's like, that bad idea. yeah, it's not a great idea, but I mean, it's just, you know, it's one of those things where it's, if you're not a hunter, a lot of people just don't even think about it. You know what I mean? No, I just, absolutely. And I think, I, I think the game commission, put out like a, oh if you're on state land or whatever you need to wear at least 250 square inches of orange right but again like people that aren't buying honey licenses aren't reading the hunter's you know manual or whatever they they don't know that right they're, they're signage or whatever but they're not reading that either i was just gonna say that like there's a sign there you know i think as hunters we probably read it because i'm looking to see like are there any restrictions or anything like that on this yeah. particular piece? Or is there somewhere that I can't go? Is there a map telling me that like, you know, cause like if I'm looking at Onyx, it might just show up as all public. But yeah. when I get there, it might be, Hey, you know, the East side of this piece is recreational hiking, mountain biking, like mm-hmm. whatever. Right. And then it might be like, Hey, you know, the West side of this piece is, you know, is, you know, hunting is, is allowed or whatever. And there's a couple spots where that's the case. And then there's a couple spots even where it's like, some chunks are just archery only, you know, yeah. and you wouldn't know that until you got there and you saw the sign and it's like, Oh, it's archery only, you know? So right. right. That's, um, uh, hopefully no one's listening to this, but <laughs> that's actually one of the little spots I'm going to dive into, um, here during late season. If my shoulder holds up and I can, and I can shoot because I feel like a lot of deer probably got pushed there. I just happened onto it this past year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple uh, in our corner, I think we're probably in the same corner, like the southeast area of Pennsylvania. Yeah, there's a lot of areas that are archery only or shotgun only or yeah, things like that. There, there's more than you would think. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I was surprised. And these pieces are really, really small, and it's really because it's um, there's houses that butt up, butt up to it, close to it, you know, and sure. so it's it's public land, and so you obviously can't hunt with any type of gun in there because you're going to be way too close. Even with a shotgun, you're going to be way too close, like sure. to be someone's home or whatever. So it uh, it makes sense. I actually went in there during archery season because there was a buck in particular I was chasing in this one area that was, I mean, he was he was big, like he was big for like Iowa standards. Even you know, it's like mm-hmm. like I would shoot him in Iowa, and I don't know many people that probably would have passed that deer in Iowa. I'd never seen a deer like that in Pennsylvania before. And I lost him. You know, I couldn't, I jumped him one day scout and I bumped him out of his bed and then I never saw him again. Um, and I thought maybe because there was another guy that I knew was hunting this particular piece. Cause I saw him come in and I knew mm-hmm. where his stands were at cause they were preset. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, man, I was like, if that guy's in here hunting really hard, I was like, and I knew how he was accessing, which wasn't great. I was like, man, he, he may have very well bump, move that deer off of here. I was like, man, I wonder if you went over that archery only piece because no one, because it's so small. Like you wouldn't even think about going to hunt it. Like it, right. when I say it's small, I'm talking like it's a parcel that you would build a house on small, you know what I mean? Oh, type of thing, yeah. you know, a couple acres, you know? Sure. And, um, and so I went in and, and checked it out and just, I saw zero. I saw a lot of doe, doe, doe tracks, you know, um, but just didn't see any, anything for buck signs. So mm-hmm. I'm going to give it a whirl here in, uh, in late season and see if I can't shake something loose and 
shake the bad voodoo off myself. <laughs> they move all over the place in the late season. What's that? They move all over the place in the late season. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> when they all come out, right? Nice. Yeah, I actually was watching, monitoring one particular camera near this general area, man. It's and I actually, uh, late rut was kind of kicking off. I had a doe hit a scrape like pretty frequently, like the last. Um, I guess it was the I don't remember. It was right around like the tenth, eleventh, twelfth. Like was whenever she was hitting it, and there was a shooter that showed up in daylight on like the twelfth of, of December. You know, wow, and. Yeah. Um, which I could have been there. It was a Saturday, you know, but I've told this story before I jacked up my shoulder. And so I've been kind of on the IR, like until I get things remedied or whatever. So, yeah. which was kind of a bummer. Cause he was one of the three that I was watching and he showed up at actually, I think it was 10 30. Like, so, so. Uh-huh. <laughs> nice man. But Hey, let's, let's get kicked off and talk about what you have going on, man. You started giving us a little bit about your background, but you know, if you wouldn't mind kind of explain, I know you work in healthcare, right. But you know, you know, we know what you do for a living, but where exactly are you from? We don't need your GPS coordinates, but like, what area are you from? So I live in Berks County. Um, okay. I work, um, I work at the Reading Hospital. Um, I've actually, I was actually born in the Reading Hospital, so I've, I've never really left the area. Right. Um, but you know, I always grew up hunting and fishing. It was big in my family. Like my, my grandfather's love fishing, love the small game hunt. My dad is, my dad and my uncles are all into it. And Oddly enough, I was homeschooled. Okay. I am virtual, surprisingly. But, <laughs> uh, uh, no, my my uncle really took advantage of that because he was pretty convinced I was his good luck charm. So it would be, you know, every day during the hunting season that he had off and be, Aaron, you coming hunting with me? Yep. Right. <laughs> so that's nice. Uh, you know, I got a lot of um, got a lot of time hunting in with him. So and and my dad too. Uh, my dad worked had to work a little bit more than my uncle, but my dad and my uncle taught me all the basics that I needed to know. Right. And, um, I kind of grew up from there. They, they, uh, they are pretty typical Pennsylvania hunters. Like Uh, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. They don't like to go too far, but they, they've always, they've always done a good job. We always had like a few private parcels that we would hunt that were small and they, you know, they're happy. They're just happy being in the woods. Like they're just good old fellows that like to, you know, they don't care if it's a buck or if it's a doe, you know, they're just happy to shoot something and yeah. just to be out. Um, in fact, my dad, my dad's only ever shot one buck when he was a teenager. Oh, really? And, yeah. It was probably 35 years, 40 years ago. So, wow. um, yeah, 40, actually probably 45 years ago. Got to get him so, on a buck, man. I, <laughs> well, I, it's not that I haven't, but right. you know, you, you know, it's just not, I don't know. It's not, it's not the end all be all for him. I right. know what you're saying. Yeah. My dad's, my dad's the same way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um, they love hearing my stories and you know, they just don't want to go that far. Right. No, I totally hear <laughs> you. Man. Go in, they're like, uh, I think I'll stay right here. <laughs> right. It's, it's funny. Like, you know, the couple of the buddies that I have that we, that are all from PA cause I grew up near Bedford, Pennsylvania, you know, so, uh-huh. um, very similar, heavy hunting heritage, started hunting whenever I was a kid, you know, same type of thing. Wasn't homeschooled, but you know, we had a, a, a back 40 that was like 32 acres or whatever. Uh-huh. And, uh, I'd come home after school, you know, whenever I was a kid and it was back in the day where, you know, yeah, I was supposed to be 16 before I could hunt by myself, but we lived out in the country. So you started doing everything a little earlier, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. It's like I started driving yeah. when I was 12, you know, down right. the road to my cousin's house or whatever, you know what I mean? As soon as you could touch the pedals and drive a stick shift on the tractor, you could take the car, <laughs> you know, that was yeah. kind of the rule. <laughs> and, uh, and so I'd come home after school and grab a shotgun and go small game hunt or whatever and just yeah. walk out the back door and do that. My dad was always kind of the same way. His big thing was more, um, you know, looking back on it. Cause I always say it's, um, I, I learned the basics from him. You know, he wasn't mm-hmm. a big bow hunter really at all. He, he would hunt a little bit with a recurve once in a while. Usually if it was, if it was rainy or really windy, he would take it out and take it for a walk and still hunt. You know, mm-hmm. I never mm-hmm. hunted from an elevated, an elevated setup until I was in my thirties. You know, everything yeah. I ever did was hunting from the ground, like always as a kid growing up. Um, that's just cause that's how my dad always hunted, but he's the same way. Like he's killed a few bucks, but he just likes to be out in the timber and he really likes small game hunting. That's like one of the things he, he does like to do. I mean, yeah. I remember just like doing like ring neck hunting with him, like all the time and like rabbit mm-hmm. hunting and squirrel hunting. Like we hit all those seasons was probably the most frequent time I'd be in the woods with him. Like we would hunt 
rifle season that would come in, you know, together. But the majority of the time he and I would spend in the woods was actually probably small game. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, my dad's the same way. Like if he could just pheasant hunt for the rest of his life, he would like, he yeah. loves that. And, and in part, like I actually, um, hunted, uh, a, a, a family friend's farm growing up a mm-hmm. lot, you know, um, I, in fact, I probably only recently got into the public land thing. I, I think, I think it's like six years now that okay. I've been hunting public land really, really dedicated and, and hard. Um, but you know, that's really where my dad does his deer hunting is on the farm. And right. it's just, it was a really great place. It's like you said, like we both know that in PA it's everything related to hunting has to do with the traditional part of it, yeah. especially like the deer rifle opener. Like, you know, yep. growing up, it was, nobody had school, like, uh, and, everybody knew where everybody was going to be. Oh, that was the big conversation. Like at camp, uh-huh. right? It was like, where are you sitting yeah. tomorrow? You know, yeah. everyone like talking about, it's like, where are you, I don't even know why we had to talk about it. Cause it's like, you just had pre hung sets or you, or you had right. like a blind somewhere. It's like, where else are you going to go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was, it's kind of funny. Cause we, I mean, the group is really small now, you know, it's my mm-hmm. friend, family and, and basically my family. And, but back in the day, it was like all, you know, all the pastors from our church and a couple of buddies here. And I don't know how nobody got a shot. <laughs> right. We were so close <laughs> to each other. And, you know, and we, we, we shot a lot of nice bucks. It's a, it's a pretty pressured farm because there's some caretakers that hunt it too. And it's right, ne- right next to the, it's in the middle of game lands. Like it's, you know, it's pretty, it, it's not like a, it's not like a, like a, you know, it's not a back 40, you know what it's I mean? Not, like, yeah. It's not manicured. Uh, you know right, what I mean? not, yeah. Yeah. No. But, um, that. yeah. Great, yeah. Great to grow up and learn a lot. Yeah, exactly, man. I mean, it's, uh, now it's my dad's very similar to what you were talking about where it's like, you know, he doesn't want to walk that far necessarily. Right. Mm-hmm. Or like you were saying, like he likes my, he likes to hear my stories, like the adventures or whatever, you know? Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> he now bought a, he lives in the Carolinas now and he bought, a piece close to where my grandparents were and where he grew up. Like there was this piece that he always wanted to own up on this mountain, an area and a piece became available and he bought it was like 60 acres or whatever. And, uh, I hunted it a a couple of times the first or the second year that he had it. I haven't been back in like two years, I don't think. Um, and I was, but I put cameras out on it and I watched the deer and I kind of tried to tell him like where he might want to set up and what he might want to do. And I'm like, watch, Mm -hmm. there was this one buck that I had like pegged, like I knew what he was doing. I knew where he was bedded. I was like, hey, I was like, yeah, I was like, you want to hunt this stand here? I was like, you know, and I was explaining, I was like, there's a little body of water, like there's a, um, there's a natural uh, spring that pops up like right near where this deer, I guess below where this deer is bedded, right? And it kind of, the, the, right. the, the terrain kind of folds down into this little, this little bottom where there's a spring and then a pool of water from the spring. I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, I was like, this deer's bedded up here. I was like, you're going to want to use this wind. You're going to want to access it like this. I was like, but go in this time of day. I was like, that, at that point, I was like, your thermals then should be rising. That way they're not pulling down into the, into this bottom. I was like, you should be okay. He's like, he looks at me. He's like, man, if I have to think of all this before I go into deer hunting, he's like, I'm never going to go. You know, like, he's just like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, and so, and I was like, well, I was like, you know, it'll give you a better chance to, you know, see this buck or whatever. He's like, how about this? He's like, I'll just call you the night before you tell me where to go sit. <laughs> he's like, so. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I'm like perfect. Like whatever I'll tell you. But he does enjoy hearing the stories. He's more probably into bear hunting right now than he is anything. Like he's on a okay. mission to try to kill a bear. So he he'll hunt he'll come up and hunt Maryland and hunt PA and yeah, you know, hunt a couple of different states to try to kill a bear. And he's gone out west. He's done some big game hunts and killed like an elk and, and stuff like that. So he does yeah. dig the adventures. Yeah. Um, you know, um, but he's he's getting older, you know, so he's a little less uh, interested in taking on the, the, the risks or the challenges yeah. per se, yeah. you know, yeah. lives vicariously yeah. through me a little bit. <laughs> my dad won't get in a tree stand anymore. My uncle still does. And, and actually they both taught me, they were really the first people to teach me about mobile hunting in general. Like really? we all had, we all had loggy bayou climbers and that's what we use. You know, mm-hmm. we didn't use uh, like ladder stands or anything on any of the small parcels that we could hunt. We hmm. always used, uh, loggy bayous on those. Um, and we never sat in the same trees. So that was something good. Like, you know, they, they knew what they were doing on those small parcels. Right. Just, they just weren't places that you would see some nice bucks in the rut and stuff like that, but they were places that would hold a lot of does and things. Right. So, yeah. And that's the hardest part. I think sometimes with some of those small 
small pieces, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I mean, so much of the information now is so much more advanced as far as like what you can know and learn about a piece and kind of decipher or whatever. Sure. You know, I would say back, <clears throat> back when I was a kid growing up and when we had that, you know, that one piece of property, it's like, you know, my dad probably never knew much about or knew anything about where deer were bedded or how they were bedding or what mm-hmm. they would look for to bed or anything like that, or understand whether or not this property is going to hold a buck versus your neighbor's property holding a buck and what they're using your property for. You know, right. it's, uh, that was also a time too, where you're probably really beholden to the, to the larger media outlets and whatever that narrative was that they wanted to kind of spell out based on whoever their advertisers were. <laughs> <laughs> right you know exactly. what i mean so it's like no yeah. right now it's like if you put a cent out it'll draw every buck in from 15 miles you just want to use a lure doesn't matter what's going on <laughs> yeah yeah for sure i know that and 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 my and my dad and my uncle would have it like yeah oh, put, put this on the tree you know right right exactly man hey i ain't gonna lie man there's some days my buddy chad and i it's like we'll talk about when we're out on a trip somewhere and it gets to the end of the trip during rut and we're just like man, I'll just take a bottle of dopey. I don't care what it is. Just douse me in it. Like something, you know, I'm looking for any kind of thing that's going to help me out. Oh man. (laughs) You know, we had this guy that hunted in our group that used to do that. Like he would literally put it on his clothes and like in his hair. Like it smelled like he showered in it. You know, right. I remember one night this, he was like, he kept seeing this same buck for like four or five days in a row from the same stand on, on the farm that I hunted. And I remember him like, run into where we all parked and he's like that buck he just was running he was running circles around me in the alfalfa field and i was trying to get away from it couldn't get away from it. <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> oh man that's awesome about got mounted yeah. by a buck <laughs> that would have been a story dude that would have been quite possibly one of the best deer camp stories ever i have one deer camp story i don't know if i've ever shared it on here actually um so, it, so back when we had that little property, so we had that small property and we had a deer camp. I don't know if I've even mentioned this name on there, but there was a small pond by my uncle's place and that's where our camp was, right? So we lived up on this hill and it was right along the Juniata River is where we mm-hmm. lived and uh, in a town called Everett and actually Graceville, which is an even smaller little place near Breezewood. Mm-hmm. And my, uh, my uncle had a house that was actually down right by the river. Right. And then my grandfather had a house that was literally on the river. Right. And so my grandfather owned a horse farm and he had horses and, and he had some acreage and he was getting older at that point and sold most of it off, but he had, he had some and we had 30 and my uncle had a few or whatever. And then our camp was at my uncle's place and there was a small pond there and, and it was called Budico pond. I don't mm-hmm. know why it was ever called Budico pond. I think it was literally one night. One of my uncles was drunk and called it Budico for, I don't know why it had to have been some type of inside joke that I was just probably too young to know about or whatever. Yeah. And so it became camp Budico. Right. And it's like, are you going to Budico? Yeah. We're going to Budico tonight. That was where we hung out. Right. And what it was, was like, it was an old pool behind. I mean, this thing had to have been from the sixties, like a pool behind RV trailer type thing. Right. Put up yeah. on blocks with the door open. And then it was, it, it, it was fixed to a small wood shanty that was built up against it. Right. So like the beds in the kitchen were in the RV. Right. And then the wood stove and like the TV was in like the wood shanty. Right. So that was, that was camp Budico. And, uh, and really all it was like my dad and I didn't stay there very often because we only lived a mile and a half from there. So we would go watch, we could get football on the antenna. So this is back when the opener was on Monday. So we would go down Thursday or Friday after Thanksgiving, shoot our guns and mm-hmm. watch some football. We could get football in the antenna. You know, we watch some football, hang out. My uncles would play cards and drink and, and stuff like that. And my dad and I would usually leave and go back home to get up Monday morning because we were hunting our property. So we we're just going to walk out and hunt our back 40. And sure. my uncle would usually come up and hunt with us. So my uncle is a little bit of a, I, lo- I love him. Like he's, he, but he, he is um, your quintessential kind of Pennsylvania. Like, and I say this affectionately, hillbilly, right? (laughs) Big old beer belly, beard down to like almost his navel. You know what I mean? Like just a big kind of gruff dude, never has a haircut. You know what I mean? Just he's a mess all the time. Right. But just, he's loud and you would think he's kind of like when you first met him, you'd be like, man, that guy's kind of a jerk or whatever. But once you like, he's just like the biggest teddy bear on the planet. You know what I mean? Sure. So sometimes like he might have, he might need the hair of the dog while he would go hunt or whatever, you know, cause he uh-huh. might be a little worse for wear the next morning. Right. Yeah, yeah. So this particular day he goes out and, uh, he, he did more 
like watching than hunting. Like, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like if I'm going to go sit in the woods, he'll take a six pack with him, you know, and sit down and like drink a couple of beers while he's hunting. <laughs> and this year it was like just crazy cold. And he, and he was pretty sure he was hung over from the night before. Right. Uh-huh. Had a couple beers and his drink was always a George Dickel. And so I'm pretty sure he always had like a little sniffer of George Dickel with him too, to <laughs> keep him warm, you know? Yeah. So he decided, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know if he thought he was going to kill anything or not, but he decided, man, it's cold out. He's like, so he decided to start a little fire. So he started a little fire on the ground, <clears throat> passed out, woke up and his pants were on fire. Oh, <laughs> and it was rolled around on the stop, drop and roll in the, <laughs> in the woods and put himself out. And he finished, finished out hunting. The story gets even weirder. He puts the fire out. And I mean, it's like World War Three, like a war zone around our house, like growing up when we were hunting. So we were surrounded by yeah. other like bigger farms that their whole oh, families yeah, came I, and they would I, drive. I mean, you know, it's like, it's, yeah, it's, I know it. You know, it sounds like, you know, the war is breaking out. Mm-hmm. And so all of a sudden he puts himself out and he's sitting on the ground and he just hears this crash, 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 right? Picks up his gun. He's like, I can't believe it, right? This deer comes running up. It was like a small spike, like he wasn't going to shoot it and it falls over dead. <laughs> just falls over dead at like 30 yards. Right. And so <clears throat> clearly like someone on the neighbors like shot it or whatever you and, know, right. and, and just sure. it took off and whatever. And so he's watching, waiting for someone to come. No one comes, no one comes, no one comes. And so, you know, he was like, well, I'll bring it up. And cause we knew all the neighbors around us and we'll go, you know, he was like, I'll just go see if any of the neighbors shot this or whatever. And so he brings it up to the house. <laughs> he's dragging it up to the house. His pants are all burned. Right. He just looks like a mess. But dad's like, what the hell happened to you? He's like, oh man, I started a fire. I caught my pants on fire. Like this deer came up and fell over dead. Like, <laughs> it's like, it's the craziest story that I've ever heard. If I, if I weren't there to actually hear him tell it, like, and, and had seen like his pants burnt. Funny thing was he wore those overalls for like the next three seasons. Like never. <laughs> Why would he? Yeah. He never did. We never did find out who actually shot the deer. Like we asked like, well, so the farms that were around us were like on each side of us. And then the bottom mm-hmm. part of the, um, down by the river, mm-hmm. a bunch of out of state folks owned cottages along the river and they would just sit along the river and just, okay. cause deer, as soon as you would shoot up, up toward us, like the farm or us, if you shot and you missed, they would run toward the river. You know, okay. so they would just sit down there and wait for deer to come running off the crop fields and down through our property and then yeah. and shoot as they're on their way down. So pretty sure someone from out of state shot it because we had no clue who it was. So he ended up tagging it, you know, just in, in keeping it or whatever and put a tag sure. on it and was he was tagged out. That was it. <laughs> That's a perfect tag out. <laughs> I know, dude. It's one of the craziest stories that I've ever I've ever seen. But like but that's what's cool about the Pennsylvania hunting tradition, man. It's like that kind of stuff, right? It's just like the yeah, weird, crazy stuff. Right. And that's part of why we do it. Wow. It's one of the, I mean, if there wasn't stories, would we do it? I don't, I don't know. It, they're the best part. Right. Yeah. Well, Cause I mean, if not, we're kind of crazy, you know, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're a little nuts, but, absolutely. but speaking of crazy, man, I want to dig into how your season's been so far. Like, so give me a, give me a little taste of how, uh, how, how did Pennsylvania treat you this year? It was, it was actually a great season. I, um, I tagged a buck on public land this year. My, like I said, my, my public land experience is, I mean, I've always hunted public land, small game, stuff like that. And I had a few good experiences, um, growing up, but this year was, this year was uh, pretty great. Um, you know, it started out with, uh, my one buddy kicked it off in the five C area where the, you know, the early archery season opens. Mm-hmm. That's down um, by me. Yep. Yep. I have a, a couple close friends that I hunt with, so. Um, I'll probably refer to them a lot, but, uh, he, he killed a doe or, or like, that was his goal. Like he's in nurse practitioner school. He doesn't have a lot of time. He's like, Oh, I'm going to go and shoot a doe early so I can get something in the freezer. And he did, he went out there and the first night he went out, he shot a doe. And, um, I told this story on, on, um, Tony Peterson's podcast, yep. uh, hunt for real. <laughs> he actually got lost in a large chunk of woods. And his phone was dying and they didn't have really great reception. Oh, but was man. able to send like a couple of like SOS texts, like, and I just get, <laughs> get these texts, like meet me at so-and-so stat bad shape, need water. I'm like, Oh no. Like I'm thinking <laughs> something ha- really bad happened to him. And yeah, those aren't I'm, good like, texts. Try- to get. No, man. I'm like trying, like I knew where he was. Cause he and I always send waypoints like this where I'm going to be. 
right. like just in case. Yeah. You know, so I ended up, we ended up, I had a, one of my buddies that lived closer to the area go, go there first. And he's like, his car's not here. Like, Jeez. like what in the world is going on? So we actually, we finally got there and I got one last text from him that said down the hill. Well, he, what was happening was he kept putting his phone on airplane mode mm. so he could like save some battery right. and keep sending those texts. Well, I got to him and he was like purpley red and all dizzy and a little disoriented. It was like, do you have water? You know, he chugs a, like two liters of water, sits down for a couple of minutes. He's like, I feel better now. He's like, I got lost. I got lost. <laughs> <laughs> he just pointed his on X in the direction of a road and started walking because he knew he wouldn't have enough battery to like follow it the whole way back. But he ended up making it to a road and he had shot a doe. I told him, man, if you want to win an award for how far back you can shoot a doe, you win. <laughs> All right. We give up. <laughs> I think it was like two miles, almost two miles. in. Oh, man. I think it was a mile and a half, mile and a half in. And, uh, you know, we've adopted the uh, the Western pack like we're not gonna we're not dragging it yeah, here yeah. a mile and a half so we all uh hiked out and packed his deer out and i think ended up getting out of the woods at like midnight or one o'clock in the morning did he <laughs> did he not take water with him or why was he so so he lives an hour hour and 10 minutes from this place right and he's it's funny because he is we all joke about it because he always has a camelback with him. Always like never leaves his house without his orange camelback. It's with him everywhere and it's always full. So he must have slammed the water on the way to wherever he was hunting. At, well, like, yeah, he's two miles back. He's probably thirsty. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he drank it on the way there and was going to stop for some. And then he was like, oh, I forgot. Like, uh, right, when right. he got to the parking lot, I was, I was too excited. I forgot. So he just hiked back in and you know, it's, middle of september it's not it's not cold, not cold. no not yeah. at all so um uh it was just funny because he didn't have water and we all we were making fun of him we we're just like dude you never you're like the guy who always yeah, has you're water. the guy who always has water <laughs> that's always. amazing and i got to make fun of him because you know we did a shed trip he and i together this year and he was like oh i got my nutrition dialed man it's always on point <laughs> So I got to make fun of him a little bit, of that. but you know, That's good awesome. laughs. And we, you know, I, I am always supposed to mention that when I tell this story that I distracted him from the blood trail, which made him track the deer for an extra 45 minutes. So, oh, that so, so that was the problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gotcha. I mean, sometimes, you know, I don't know if you've ever, ever been lost. I've, I've been legit lost one time in my life, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like the weirdest thing. It, it was very similar to what had happened to him. I did have water. Um, <laughs> it, but, and I've told this story before too, so I'll just make it really brief. It was, it was the first time I went out of state to hunt. I was in Ohio mm -hmm. and I went into this, this place. I had scouted a different part of it in the summer. And when I was there in the summer, you know, obviously there was stuff on the trees. This is during rut when I was there. And so it looked completely different when I got there. Yeah. There, was, there was a lot of blow down and just really kind of thick and gnarly. And I got in there and, um, this was like prior to me having like on X, this might've even been like pre on X just in general. And I had like a little Garmin, like GPS, like, yep. like a $99 one, like nothing like an in reach or anything like that. Right. And, uh, I always had a problem with it cause it would like turn on when it was in my pack. So whenever I was driving there, I found this out after the fact, when I was driving to Ohio, it actually got bumped in my pack and turned on. So it was on for like, from the time I packed my truck until I got out, which would have been like know. however many hours. Cause I packed it the night before. And so I got into the woods and I was, I hiked for maybe 40 minutes, you know, and I'm however far in I can get in 40 minutes, maybe a mile, a mile and a half, like whatever it is. And it died. And then I had no clue where I was, where I was at anymore. And I was like, you gotta be kidding Yikes. me. Right. And it's, I got there in the afternoon. So it was, I was going in for an evening. So it's getting ready to start to get dark and, this, that, the other. And I ended up like, I actually had that like, Oh crap moment where like you recognize, like I saw the same tree like three times. I was just walking in a circle. I right And, but the good thing was I recognized <laughs> that I was doing it. So I was like, let's stop and sit down real quick and like assess what's happening here, you know, before drink we some water, <laughs> drink some water. And 
I literally went through like my pack, you know, my mental Rolodex of what I had in my pack and like, what are the first things I'm going to shed? Like if I need to keep moving or whatever, what am I going to drop? How much food do I have? Can I stay out here overnight? Like those sure. types of things. And, um, and then I was like, how do I get out of here? And I was like, well, if I go up this ridge, I was like, I know there's a river close by to where I'm hunting or where I parked my truck. Right. I was like, if I can maybe get to the top of the ridge and maybe if I use my stand, I can climb high enough in a tree if I have to, or maybe branches or whatever, and just get to where I can see the sun glistening off the river. Like I should be able to see the reflection, like light right. coming up off of it or whatever. I was like, if I can do that, I'll at least know what direction the river is. And if I can at least get to toward the river, I know I'll hit the road at some mm -hmm. point. Right. And so <clears throat> that was what I did. I was able to see where the reflection was. It was like, all right, it's this direction. So I started walking. And then once I started walking, I don't know, it was probably like an hour, maybe a little longer. And then I finally recognized something. I was like, oh, I remember passing this, right? Because there was so much blow down in there. Everything just looked the same, you know? Right. And I finally recognized like a particular like stump that was near like this old logging road. And I was mm -hmm. like, bingo, I know where I'm at. So then I was like, well, I'm just going to set up here and hunt, you know, I was like, cause it's not quite dark yet. And then I'll hunt this mm -hmm. tomorrow morning. I did that. And it was the happiest accident that ever happened because I killed like 126, 128 inch deer, like three days later nice. out of that spot. I screwed up on one a little bit bigger than that the day on the second day. And then my buddy killed an eight point the day after I killed one out of that same spot. And oh, so that's yeah. been like the honey hole. Like if I don't have any, if I don't have plans to go anywhere else out of state, I usually go back there because mm -hmm. every year, if I'm not there, my buddy goes and it produces like he sees, you know, Something. anything from like a mid one twenties to like, you know, a mid one forties, like we'll see yeah. there every, every year, you know? So right. that was that, that was the happy accident of getting lost, but it's unnerving man to not know where the hell you're at. Yeah. I mean, it was unnerving to be on the other end of it. Being oh, like sure. That's like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to meet you out there. Don't worry. I'll be there. And then, you know, calling his wife on the way, I called his wife on the way over because she was texting my wife and was like, wait, something's going on. Like he's not, you know, I'm like, Oh yeah. He said his phone's going to die. I'm going to meet him out there. Don't worry. Yeah, like, Oh, I'm it. just going to go get his deer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> nice. So your buddy killed, killed a doe early so he, part of the year. And what was, uh, what was the deal with you, man? How'd you do? So I did, I did good. You know, we had, I, I actually didn't get to hunt my honey hole this year. Cause, um, I got up into a place that, you know, we usually like to hunt, uh, mid October mm -hmm. and, um, he had some time actually. And we decided to go to this place that, um, we've seen a couple nice bucks and he has a, a pretty good spot there. And, you know, we were, Oh, this is a good night. The weather was perfect. And, um, we had noticed that, uh, that on our previous hunts that we, we started seeing some chasing here and there. So mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, we'll go out here. It looks like the right time. And it what was, was the, the, right what was the date on this uh october 27th I okay think it was. yep so last year we hunted it more towards the min of, middle of october because we did have some nice cold weather mm -hmm. um like uh, around the 18th last year and that we saw a lot of nice stuff out there last year um so uh one <laughs> this is props to you so um i know that you're always kind of checking out when you when you go into an area and you're noticing like this is where the freshest sign is like i'm just gonna i'm just gonna set up right well we i had a camera in this in an area right near where i had seen a really nice buck last year and uh we put it on a scrape in, uh, in august and the scrape actually hadn't opened up i had like a couple small bucks and one nice buck and i was like yeah i don't know, I don't know. It, it doesn't look like anything shaping up but before i got to the camera there were three or four scrapes that were just like like hours old like the dirt was you could still see, see the sprinkles of dirt on the leaves right and everything was wet and you know like you know <laughs> the dirt was moist and like it was just i'm like like this is over like only 25 or 50 yards from where i normally would get into a tree and i'm like i'm just gonna do it like what, yeah. what like, I'm, just, I'm just gonna readjust because this is where like normally they would be in a little bit deeper, but it was odd because they were strangely close to a road where people hike. Right. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like this, this is going to feel weird, but I'm going to do it anyway. And, uh, as usual, my buddy was like seeing does and seeing little bucks chasing stuff early on. And I'm like, okay, well there's something happening, but I didn't see anything yet. So we'll see what happens. Finally, I saw 
a doe go running along the edge of this clear cut that was pretty far below me. And I saw the buck that I shot chase her. I guess, I, you know, I saw this buck chasing her down along the edge of this clear cut. And they were getting pretty far away from me. So I just, I instinctively just grabbed my grunt tube and let out a big growl. And I'm like, that's never going to work. Well, she responded to it. Oh, wow. Not, not the buck. The doe just came running up this trail. I don't know if she was just like, get this little, you know. Right, get, get, him, get him out of get here. Get this buck off of me or whatever. So she's there, you know, eating browse underneath my tree near all these scrapes. And my wind, I don't know how it happened. Like, I think I think the thermals were just up high enough still mm -hmm. that they were blowing over his head. But he didn't like something like he was just, you know, doing one of those where they stay behind a tree. They'll move a little doing bit. The, doing the old okey doke, kind of like popping their uh -huh. head out. They're not quite uh -huh. sure what's going on. Well, it's, you know, I'm like, well, I have an hour of light left. By the time I shot this buck, I think I had 15 minutes of light left. Oh, I, I mean, he just stood there and would like stare and kind of look around and then make a move, you know. So he finally just kept coming on this trail and I, I got, he actually, I'm, I didn't make it. I was, this is one of the things that I uh, was probably going to talk about a little bit later, but it's kind of a good time for it is, uh, um, I did, I didn't make a great shot. I, I spined him. Right. So I had to, had to make a, a follow up shot, but as far as tracking goes, that's great, but it never makes you feel good. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Hear but, that. uh, but I was super pumped, man. And this is the, uh, this is only the second buck I've killed with my bow. Okay. Wow. So I've bow hunted just about my entire life. Uh, maybe missing two or three years during college. I think I missed a year of bow hunting or and here and there, but, um, you know, I've killed a lot of does and I just never really hunting the farm and stuff. I, I had some opportunities at bucks. Um, most of the time I missed or, mm -hmm. you know, I got busted or something. Um, and starting out like the, the public land hunting thing, I'm like, this is where I'm going to get, this is where it's going to happen. Right. And, um, I just, it's, it's just such a different experience, like being able to get out and get on a big parcel and just move around and find things that you've never really been able to see before. Right. Yeah. No, I totally understand that, man. Cause like it was, you know, <clears throat> I always say this, man, like the thing, like, look, hunt whatever you want to hunt, whatever makes you happy. It's not like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just different. One's not necessarily better than the other per se. I sure. just know from my own personal experiences of like, I've hunted plenty of private growing up, you know, and I was just never, we just never had a piece that was great. You know what I right. mean? Like to where it's like, I just didn't see a lot of bucks on those places that I wanted to kill. You know what I mean? There yeah. were a lot of like year and a half olds or two year olds or whatever. And, and if that's, if someone wants to shoot those, like that's, that's cool. That's fine. Like that's, I don't yeah. want anyone to think that, that I'm against that. Cause I'm not like whatever gets your rocks off. Like you should do that as long as it's legal. Mm -hmm. I don't care. And it was a me illegal means of take. I don't care. Um, but for me, it's like, that wasn't, necessarily doing it for me you know what i mean right. like because i st i always you know i'm transparent on this show it's like i started bow hunting late like i didn't start bow hunting until i was like 30 you know mm -hmm. i gun hunted all my life growing up you know i took some time off because i was a musician and was living in orlando doing music and my schedule just didn't really allow me to do a lot of hunting mm -hmm. and then when we finally moved back to pennsylvania we were moving back to a state where i could hunt that was the criteria like when we right. decided we were leaving i was like i don't care where we go so long as I can hunt wherever I go. So it was either here or Colorado. We ended up here because we have family here. Yeah. And, um, and for me, it was public was exactly what you kind of said. Like I wasn't seeing the type of deer I wanted to see. And I knew I was limited by the property. It was like, cause mm -hmm. I couldn't just venture across the property lines to the neighbors or whatever, you know? Right. And what sealed it for me was, you know, and I'll make this short because plenty of people probably heard this, but there was a buck that I had watched for three years, I think three years. Um, well, actually, I watched him for two. I knew of him for three, put it that way. He didn't catch my eye until the second year. Um, mm -hmm. And he was living on the neighbors, and I knew that. It wasn't, I didn't figure that out until like the end of the second year. And mm -hmm. then um, I saw him during late season, I hunted him 
four times and four four days in a row and had three encounters with him in four days. Yeah. And I just couldn't get an arrow in him. And I knew where he was bedded. I just couldn't hunt where he was bedded because it was on the neighbor. So I was having to catch mm-hmm. him at a pinch point to a food source. You know what I mean? It was what right. it was. And um, I hunted him the opening day of the following season because we had a cold front, you know, that October 1st or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Nice high pressure day. Slipped into where I thought it was going to be. I glassed him in the summer. I knew what he was doing. I knew where he was bedded. I was like, he is dead opening day. Mm-hmm. He read the script, but he came in with a bachelor group and one of the younger bucks got behind me or got downwind of me and didn't blow out, but just turned around and was like, something's not right and backed off. Right. And he followed mm-hmm. and I never got a shot. My buddy Tate, the guy who actually got me into bow hunting, um, older gentleman, he ended up shooting him with a gun that gun season. So I was glad that he got him, but mm-hmm. that was just kind of like the lesson for me. It was like, that was <clears throat> probably four years of hunting that property, mm-hmm. you know, and that was really the only one only buck that I was willing to pull my bow back on and it took me a couple years to like two years to figure him out you know and then sure really only had one opportunity on the entire farm to try to kill him because he didn't use the the property anywhere else in daylight sure you know and so that for me was like if I want to consistently have the type not even kill but if I want to consistently have the type of encounters I want to have I need to be able to roam and I need to be able to go find where the deer are and not wait for them to come to me Yep. And so that was the big kind of light switch moment for me that, and I was listening to a lot of Dan Enfault, you know, I was listening, you know, uh, to a lot of the stuff he was talking about, um, at that point was introduced to like, you know, a lot of the stuff from the Tequistos, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it was really that more aggressive style of hunting that I wanted to do. And I was starting to do some of that on the farm, Yeah. but it was really hurting me on the farm. Right. You know? I, yeah. So I, it was, I'm almost from the same. Yeah. Yep. So it was like, it, that was like the light bulb moment where I was like, look, if this stuff is really going to work for me, I got to go to where I can be aggressive, not worry about bumping deer so often mm-hmm. and not so much care. Like I don't get target deer. Like I don't, I don't necessarily name them or whatever. It's like, you know, I'll run cameras in the summer and get inventory and I'll try to find, you know, the, the more mature deer that I have in the area. And I'll mm-hmm. say, all right, it's like these three or four deer are the one, one of the ones I want to kill. I don't really care which one it is, you know. And if a, a good looking three year old that I've never seen before comes by, he's getting stuck. You know sure. what I mean? So yeah. I'm looking, like my buddy Josh Prophet says, man, it's like I, I'm hunting like a coyote. I'm hunting for opportunity. Yep. You know what I mean? And that's really kind oh, yeah. of how I, how I how I approach it. And so I do look at a specific deer, and I will try to kill one, but it's not the end all be all. And if I right. bump him then so be it that big one this year early season huge deer bumped him you know what i mean and i was just like eh, i'll find another one <laughs> you yep. know yeah well and you have to and the nice thing about it is is it, it's public land like you're not screwing somebody else's hunt up that mean you know somebody that means something to you like oh i was really hoping to get a shot at that one or something you know right and that like the people that i i hunt with on private like they would never like they wouldn't care like oh you spooked it whatever you know, like what are you gonna do right it, it is it is a nice feeling to be like oh well i have a thousand more acres that i can wander around on and go find another one yeah and um like you said about inventory it, it's hard to get you know we're in the we're in the we're in the big woods we don't have a lot of i mean you know you have a lot of farms in pa but when you get to those big public parcels like maybe there's a little food plotter here here or there or something like that but not enough to make a difference or to have a lot of drawing power or Right. Especially for mature bucks, because, you know, everybody, if it's a acre food plot on, you know, 5,000 acre game lands or something, there's probably five tree stands around it. Oh, 100 percent, man. Yeah. So that's just not where the big ones are. Yep. So collecting inventory can be a little bit more difficult because they're, you know, other than things that maybe pinch them down, mm-hmm. like you're not looking at like, oh, like here's a, just a single patch of oak trees. Like PA is all oak trees, like right. everything's oak trees. Yeah. Um, so you're looking at other things, but I think one of the things for mature bucks that I've found is the areas that they like to get away from people are more consistent. And then maybe I don't find four specific bucks, or maybe I do. Like I have a, I have a bunch that I have, pictures on from a whole ridge system yeah you sent me some man there's some hammers you know yeah there's some hammers and i've seen like i've had encounters with them you know i 
I uh, will talk about my year last year a, a little bit later, maybe, but, um, you know, I've had a lot of encounters with them. I've, I've have, have a lot of pictures of them, but it's really about the area that you're hunting because this year, going back to the COVID thing, this was the first time I've run into people on the area that I like, that I really prefer to hunt uh, mature bucks. I ran into people this year. Right. I did. I have, I have hunted there, I think th two or three years now in this specific spot. I've never seen a person there. Right. And, you know, I had my SD card stolen out of my cameras, never happened before. Same here. <laughs> you know, and yep. so it's, it, and, you know, uh, a point that, uh, like a ridge system point that my buddy was sitting on that I'd, I'd set him up on. Uh, one day he went there last year and saw, I think, 10 bucks and probably, I think four of them were, um, you know, three and a half years old or better. Right. And this year we had, we didn't see a buck on it wow. didn't see a buck on it so it's i i really think it has to do with the pressure that right. was in there but um yeah. you know it's all like you said it's it's really an opportunity thing yeah no it totally is and it's yeah and you're right it's trying to find those little places like where they're going to consistently want to be because they're away from away from people and a lot of times when you find those spots it's like the one spot where i had that good deer this year it was water access pretty much only. I mean, you could walk in if you wanted to, but you're not going to see anything if you walk in because you have to walk through so much stuff to get there. That it's, And that's why when I scouted it, I walked it. And as I was scouting it last winter, I was like, I didn't have a kayak at that time. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And I was like, I was like, man, if I want to hunt this and it was good. I mean, there was like a hammer primary scrape area. Like you just walk in and you see it and you're like, oh man. Yeah. You know, and you walk yeah. the perimeter and you're like, oh dude, it's completely covered. Like no one, no one in their right mind would walk in here. And if they did, they're never going to see anything. So they wouldn't, you know, right. It just blow it out. Yeah. And so I was like, man, if I'm going to hunt this, I got a, I got a kayak in, you mm -hmm. know, and that was how I, how I got in and consistently had good deer showing up on that particular scrape. And I didn't see a person in there until, uh, gun season. I got a person like one person on camera, you know? And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think finding those little nooks and crannies where, people aren't going to be is, is key. And then having the room to roam to kind of go, go track them down. You know, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the biggest thing, man. For me, it's like, I like hunting and not waiting. You know, it's like, I want to be able to move and go, go find them. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, cause if they're not in one place, they're somewhere. Right. You know, it's like, it's just a matter of putting in the time and going and, and figuring out where they're at, you know? And sometimes right. you come up with snake eyes, like, there was another piece this year. It was pretty big. I had a good deer on and I lost him and I hiked six miles across that mountain trying to figure out like where he was at, try to pick up anything of his sign. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Yeah. Zero. And, like he's just like vanished like a phantom. Like, you they know what do. I mean? And, yeah, they do. They, uh, it's almost like they know where you have your stuff and where you're going to look for them. Like, they, they avoid it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There was one area that I didn't look cause I thought it was, and in hindsight, it was pro I probably should have looked because it was. Um, I talked about this with Greg Litzinger on a previous podcast, but it was a little closer to houses and a little closer to, like to the parking area. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> I always had him headed in that direction early in the year, and then he vanished, and I have no clue where he went. And that was really the only spot I didn't look because I was just like, "There's no way he's going to be down there." You know what I mean? I was like, uh -huh. I, I talked myself out of it. Um, I think I did get one picture of him during rut. He passed through at night. I couldn't tell well enough to tell if it was him exactly, but the frame looked about right. Sure. Um, but he was a, he was a nice deer, you know, would like to have, would have liked to have run in, uh, run into him, man. But all right, folks, that is a wrap for part one. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five star rating and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a, a sub there too. It'd be super appreciative if you do those couple things for me. And before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, Skull Brew Coffee Company, and Maven Optics. And until next time, we'll see y'all.